Well, welcome everyone to Functional Medicine Research. I'm Dr. Hedberg, and I'm really looking forward today to my conversation with Dr. Kara Fitzgerald. Uh, she's a naturopathic physician and a real thought leader in the, the functional medicine arena. She got her doctorate in naturopathic medicine from National College of Natural Medicine, and she did postdoctoral training with the Metametrics Laboratory, which is now Genova. And she's also certified through the Institute for Functional Medicine, and she's on faculty uh, at the Institute for Functional Medicine. So she's been published in a lot of papers, and she's been involved in various publications in peer-reviewed journals that she's written. She's contributed to functional medicine textbooks, and she recently wrote a chapter for the new integrative gastroenterology book, and that's Dr. Jerry Mullen's book on gastroenterology. And she's also co-authored an ebook. It's called The Methylation Diet and Lifestyle. And we'll be talking about methylation today. So, Kara, welcome to the show. Thanks, Nick. It's nice to uh, reconnect with you. We were, I was just dialoguing with you. I'll tell your audience that we knew each other way back when I was doing my postdoc. I think you were mm -hmm. an, one of our early folks to um, really become an expert in the specialty testing we were offering. So anyway, it's nice to reconnect. Yes, yes, it's great. Um, so some really interesting things to talk about today. And as I mentioned, we're going to talk about methylation. And so why don't we just start with some bedrock information for uh, our lay people and practitioners about you know, what is methylation? And if you could just give us a basic overview of yeah. what it is and how it works. Yeah, sure. Listen, if you've got any serious sort of biochemistry history geeks, um, it was actually, we just, the body, it was just, we were, the, the, our ability to methylate compounds, um, to detoxify them was first discovered in 1887, if anybody needs a cocktail party uh, factoid. But it was, it was long after that, before the methylation cycle was actually characterized and s methionine was discovered. You know, it was in the 20th century when, when all of that was teased out. Um, so methylation is really quite simply, as you know, either we're putting a, 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 a methyl group, with a car, which is a carbon and three hydrogens, either we're, we're uh, adding it to a compound or we, we are, we're, we're removing it from a compound, um, or we are producing s methionine, which is the cofactor that carries that methyl group. Um, that can be put on compounds. So that's fun. That's what methylation is, and it's everywhere. You know, it's it's it, in internet lore. It says uh, those 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 folks talking a lot about methylation say it's happening in every cell all of the time. And I would argue that it's probably pretty close to that. I mean, it's interesting to me that we use this addition of a methyl group um, or the methylation cycle, which interfaces, as you know, intimately with the folate vitamer cycle and sulfuration. But, you know, it's interesting that we use these in such important fundamental um, processes, you know, body-wide. Um, just to give you a couple of ideas, Nick, of its importance, you know, three of the four DNA bases require a functioning folate slash methylation cycle for production. Three of the four bases. And that fourth base, which is cytosine, is the base that in DNA methylation gets methylated. So for, D, for, for gene expression, fundamentally for gene expression, we have to have good methylation. And for DNA repair, we need good methylation. So just think about it. To make DNA, to regulate DNA expression, to repair DNA, all requires really, you know, high functioning methylation. And so just as I've been into this more and more and more, I, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, I, 
I just ponder how interesting it is that we just, we use it everywhere. So, and then additionally, a lot of the folks interested in methylation know, for instance, that we're detoxifying hormones, um, toxins, histamine clearance, neurotransmitter synthesis, phospholipid synthesis, like, you know, choline is a really methyl donor uh, demanding process. We use it to um, make creatine, you know, in, in, in muscle energy. Um, and, you know, and kind of on and on. Uh, stem cells. So here's another really interesting thing, going back to that epigenetic regulation or the regulation of DNA expression. Our stem cell fate is determined by our DNA methylation pattern. So gametogenesis and embryogenesis, high methylation activity time, very much so. So are you going to be a brain cell or a lung cell or a gut cell, et cetera, et cetera? Those, stem, those pluripotent stem cell roles are defined through DNA methylation patterns. Um, and, and prior to that, you know, the, the DNA methylation patterns from mom and dad, you know, in the sperm and egg, those are mostly wiped clean, and then new patterns are laid down. They're not completely wiped clean. And so the heritability of DNA methylation is actually established in this really early time. And I, I know you're paying attention in this arena. I don't know if you're how much you're focusing in it, but I know that you're a really smart guy with a broad area of interest. So, you know, the 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 heritability the epigenetic heritability is um is in this arena. The fact that we don't completely erase all of the DNA methylation patterns from mom and dad or grandma and grandpa and you know generations prior and they're carried forward. So it's just it's extraordinary. This whole area is, has become quite interesting to me, but I'm going to stop for a minute. <laughs> right. I mean, so with, with so many connections to, to methylation, since it's kind of at the, the core of, of what's going on in the cell, it has to be difficult at times to figure out if it is truly connected to the patient's condition. So mm, good question. Yeah. How, how do you approach uh, the need or, you know, the, the interest in looking deeper into methylation in particular patients? Are there any particular conditions that, that really stand out? Well, that's a really good question. Um, arguably, we all need to be addressing um, uh, methylation and arguably, we want to be doing it really upstream. So there's, you know, there are certain times we're going to be leaning on it more heavily, like, you know, uh, pre, preconception planning, you know, when, you know, women who are pregnant, we, we want to be leaning on it more heavily. Um, I know there are a host of conditions that, you know, some of us in, in, in our arena have associated with methylation defects more obviously, yeah, probably the best evidence is around depression and, um, you know, other neuropsychiatric conditions, certainly in autism, we, we, we common, commonly see methyl defect, methylation defects. So, you know, the, I, but I want to, I guess I want to say that my, my, so a, a big practice changer for me has been thinking much more upstream and globally about methylation and really putting a lot of attention on epigenetic methylation. And let me, I want to give you a little bit of the backstory, Nick. Interrupt mm -hmm. me if I'm going on too long, but let me just talk about that. And that I think this will kind of elucidate where I'm coming from. So, you know, back in the lab, you know, years ago, we were looking at methylation all the time, looking at amino acids associated with the methylation cycle. Of course, we always look at homocysteine, et cetera. We're looking at sulfuration. And so we've been thinking about it for a long time. And then we started to layer in single nucleotide polymorphisms. And, you know, in the hopes that we would get sort of a more, a, a, a deeper, more useful clinical picture, arguably, I don't know, we, we didn't, I don't know that, that that, that MTHFR status always lends much clarity to a patient's condition. I don't know that it, you know, I, I would say it's actually the exception that it really game changes how we approach patients. Um, so we had the organic acids and the various biomarkers there. We layered in the single nucleotide polymorphisms and, you know, maybe a little benefit, not that much. So uh, you know, flash forward epigenetic research starts really, really pouring out over maybe the last eight years or so. I mean, extraordinarily so. And for me in about, I don't know, 2012, 
2013, enough studies on epigenetics and cancer were moving across my desk that I realized I needed to dive in. Like I needed to start to understand this in a deeper way. Honestly, you know, it was yet another omics investigation and I had a little bit of omics fatigue at that time. And I was like, oh, you know, here's just another really complicated kind of arcane um, physiologic process going on that I need to understand. Damn it. But there I, I did dive in and the bulk of the research is in, you know, the epigenetics of cancer and by and large, you know, the most important epigenetic mark um, uh, appears to be DNA methylation. And as I unpacked it, it became a practice game changer for me. So the background in it is that in cancer, so the tumor microenvironment is very effective at harnessing our own epigenetic um, machinery and take taking over DNA methylation for its own, you know, nefarious ends. So when we hypermethylate a promoter region of a gene, that gene is effectively turned off. When we hypomethylate it, when we when those when either there is an absence of methyl groups on um, the the gene or those methyl groups are removed, that gene is allowed to express. So the tumor microenvironment can very efficiently hypermethylate tumor suppressor genes. And so the first question to, for me as a, as a functional medicine doctor, looking at methylation, prescribing B vitamins, high dose B12, folate all of the time was, well, geez, you know, do I need to stop doing that in my patients who I'm suspecting cancer in or who are in, you know, an age range of an increased risk or who have cancer, et cetera. You know, these, these stopped me in my tracks. The, these papers that were pouring out hypermethylated and, you know, could, could supporting or pushing methylation forward have some kind of an impact. Um, and it turns out there isn't a suggestion in the literature that perhaps it could. Now, has that stopped me from prescribing B vitamins when my patients need them? No, not at all. But I began to wonder about an upstream approach to methylation. There's nothing in the literature. So what, uh, let me actually back up and say hypomethylation of the DNA, so global hypomethylation of all the DNA is something that happens as we age all of us are moving towards less global methylation. But then there are these regions of hypermethylation where we don't want them. It's like, our, it's like our DNA methylation becomes disordered as a part of the aging process. And you can see that it underscores all these complex chronic diseases, including autoimmunity. You had mentioned that your audience you know, tends to be interested in that. You see these disordered patterns happening in all these diseases of old age. Um, so globally, it's, an, it's, a, it's low methylation, but these pockets of imbalance, of hypermethylation and good genes being shut down, like NERF2 or tumor suppressor genes and on and on. Mm -hmm. so, so my first question was, you know, can we effectively move upstream and prescribe a, a methyl donor rich diet? And looking in the literature, as you know, there's, there are no studies on greens, on leafy greens causing cancer. So we know these are safe, safe, you know, beets, a beet rich diet and cancer really not out there. Even liver, which is a methyl donor superfood, you know, there's no association unless maybe you ate really, really lousy liver uh, with causing cancer. So we saw that we could actually push methylation with a diet and be on safe grounds. So that was thing one. But what do we do about these regions of hypermethylation? Like, how do we support that? Well, a major aha for me was reading these mostly in vitro and animal studies. This is a new, new area that some really beautiful polyphenols that we're using in practice all of the time actually have the capacity to inhibit or almost adaptogenically augment DNA methylation. So those famous polyphenols include EGCG from green tea, um, curcumin, rosmarinic acid from rosemary, lycopene, um, and on and on. So they can help you know, in vitro and some animal studies, actually methane is another one. I'm just thinking about that because I was talking about it to somebody else yesterday. Um, these guys appear to be able to help allow for the re-expression of formally inhibited tumor suppressor genes. 
And probably, Nick, this is one of the reasons why we prescribe these polyphenols. We know that they're very pleiotropic in their mechanisms, but I would argue that this ability to augment DNA methylation behavior is a big reason why they are such important players in our toolkit. So we just, I happen to have an extraordinary nutrition team here, and it's headed by our nutrition director, Romilly Hodges. Um, and I, I basically, I put this on her. I said, Romilly, let's design this diet. You know, methyl donor heavy across the board, plus these methylation adaptogens that we were, we were talking about. And then the other piece that I started to look at was, you know, us as functional medicine providers, we're really used to sitting in there and augmenting um, uh, uh, reaction kinetics, you know, influencing the rate of reactions, pushing enzymes forward and so forth. We're all influenced by Jeff Bland and Bruce Ames and, you know, those guys. So that's how we think. But if you step outside to the rest of the world, they think about re regulating epigenetic expression with things that don't at a glance have anything to do with methylation. And so we started to look there as well. Turns out there's a whole lot of research on exercise favorably augmenting DNA methylation. Turns out that sleep, if it's um, disordered, can have a real detrimental effect on uh, methylation, in particular DNA methylation. Um, it turns out that stress can really impact DNA methylation. Um, so we, we pulled in all these lifestyle components. Not surprisingly, toxin exposure can uh, wreak havoc on DNA methylation as well as DNA itself and DNA repair. Uh, so we pulled in these other pieces and created this lifestyle program. So we have this diet and then we added in, you know, some, some recommendations around exercise, uh, paying attention to sleep, um, you know, bringing in meditation, you know, keeping the diet clean and so on and so forth. And it ended up becoming this program that we enacted in practice most, you know, just based on that original research in, in, in DNA methylation and cancer. So at, once we started to do that, we enacted it fully in some patients, and then in other patients, we would layer it into whatever other therapeutic um, dietary prescription we initiated. So if, if we had somebody on a FODMAP, you can layer in some of the MDL ideas. And so we're addressing this, we're addressing the methylation piece in everybody, and it's really pretty straightforward. But once we actually started to do that in practice, and we were kind of, we were pretty inspired, we were pretty excited about it. I actually, we, I, pre I presented it at AIC. So we had this all written down and presented it at the Institute for Functional Medicine's annual international conference in, in 2016. Um, and then we, 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 other places started to want to hear our content. So we presented it at Cleveland Clinic, Fun Center for Functional Medicine, and, um, you know, a, a host of, of, of other places. Um, but the next question became, can we actually prove that we're changing epigenetic expression? Could we do that? And I'm just a, you know, I'm a clinician in Sandy Hook, Connecticut. Like, I'm not a research scientist. Um, and so we thought, you know, what, how would we actually do that? You know, what could we do? Do we give the diet to folks on Facebook and have them commit and, you know, fill out a multiple symptom questionnaire? I mean, is, is that what we can do? Or could we have a handful of folks come in the office and track their homocysteine? I mean, how would we, or do, uh, you know, one of the doctor's data or Genova panels looking at Sam and Sa? Um, and we, we just sort of talked through these ideas, Romilly and myself, and, you know, they were all insufficient insufficiently satisfying because we weren't really going to be able to tell from those investigations that yes we are affecting epigenetic methylation and by some you know just serendipity miraculous sort of unfolding um, metagenics came into the picture Brent Eck their CEO and he gave me a unrestricted grant to actually research this in earnest and so we've just completed the methylation diet and lifestyle trial you can actually google it and find our clinicaltrials.gov entry and read all the details around it um, we've just finished it national university of natural medicine their health got research in institute they're basically a clinical research center they um ran our study for us and I'm co-PI with their director, um, Ryan Bradley. And so we just finished our clinical arm of it and we are unpacking our results now. 
one of the uh, scientists helping me in this journey is Dr. Moshe Seff, who I've podcasted with, and he's one of the premier epigeneticists. So he's helped us design it, and he's now helping us unpack the, the results. And we used a, a research-only um, an array from Illumina where they're uh, looking at 850,000 sites, so almost a million methylation sites, DNA methylation sites on the on the genome. Plus, we also looked at um, S adenosyl methionine and, and S adenosyl homocysteine, and we we got a bunch of um, validated subjective questionnaires. And we had uh, the other another big thing we did, and then I'm going to hush and let you take over <laughs> for a minute. Is um, we used our nutrition team as nutrition coaches. And so our participants had careful attention and support in enacting the plan. And in fact, NUNM thought our program was onerous and they didn't anticipate the kind of success that we had in adherence. Um, so they were, they were studying us enacting this diet. They were really curious how the nutrition team would, would bear out in, in executing it. And I think it went, I think it went really well and we'll be able to sort of track adherence data as well. So mm -hmm. it was, it was middle-aged men. It's a pilot study. We had 20 controls and we had, um, 18 participants at the end that completed everything. Mm -hmm. So there it is, Nick, my download. That's excellent. <laughs> Very exciting. Isn't it exciting? Yeah, I want to uh, get clear on, on a few things regarding genetic SNPs and, and testing. So you can, have an, you can have an individual who has a lot of genetic SNPs for quote unquote poor methylation, but they might actually be doing okay because mm -hmm. they're, they're doing all the right things in their life. That's right. And then you can have another individual who has very good genetics for methylation but it's not doing well because they're not maybe they're hyper well, they're inflamed yeah that's right those kinds of things so that's right that's right so regarding let me tell you let me actually say this sure, <laughs> so, sure. like you can see I'm, I'm i'm pretty impassioned about it so what we know you know when we when we look at the genetics of breast cancer for instance it's a minority of women who have the BRCA mutation a minority. So we always look at genetic as, at genetics as far as a risk factor. Of course, if you have the BRCA mutation, your likelihood is incredibly high, but only a minority of us actually have it. Well, it turns out that you can hyper, that that BRCA gene can be hypermethylated and inhibited, and it is indeed associated with hormone sensitive cancers. So just you know, that's a clear example of what you've just stated. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So let's just uh, cover a couple of these. So most people are going to be aware of things like MTHFR, uh, COMT, and then things like in the blood, homocysteine, B12, folate, things like that. Can you just talk a little bit about your approach to identifying the SNPs and then the other testing that you're doing to see if methylation is, is compromised? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we will eventually be using these the epigenetic tests in our clinical practice these will these will come to be ready for prime time and we'll be looking at them routinely soon enough um but they're not yet so hopefully you know hopefully we'll have them at our fingertips so so barring epigenetic investigations um and there, there is actually, and we can talk about this later, we can talk about the limited testing that is available if we have time, Nick, but there is a mm -hmm. DNA age, there's a whole DNA um, methylation clock, and there's all sorts of interesting stuff that we can have, we have some limited access to right now. Um, so barring access to bu the bulk of those investigations, yeah, we have to just look at, you know, there are some decent methylation panels available. As I mentioned earlier, doctor's data panel is available to clinicians. Genova just launched a panel, um, and those are fabulous starting points, and they include, you know, a SAMHSA ratio, which is very useful, um, well documented in the literature. Of course, homocysteine, even with homocysteine's limitations, it's still a workhorse assessment. It's still useful. I will say this, though. Um, <laughs> this is what we saw in our study, and you know, what I've, I'm reading in the literature, 
we as functional medicine providers put a lot of emphasis in having, you know, a, a homocysteine somewhere in the neighborhood of seven or, you know, whatever. I, I can tell you that in our study, we didn't move homocysteine uh, significantly. We, 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 we did change other markers um, significantly. Uh, Acidenosyl homocysteine, we did. I, even though I told you before, I'm not supposed to talk about that, but I'm going to give you those two <laughs> limited pieces. And as a functional medicine clinician, we might look at that and say, geez, that's not much, except that when you jump over and look at the DNA methylation changes, where uh, without going to, into specifics yet until we publish, we did make some really big changes. So the take home for me here is, you know, we're in there pushing the methylation cycle um, all of the time as functional medicine providers, you know, probably we're not able to yet realize what kind of an impact or see what kind of impact that's having on what they call the methylome or DNA methylation. And the take home for me is that it didn't take, you know, some heavy lifting in the methylation cycle to affect pretty big change in DNA methylation. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And epigenetics, just so everyone can understand what that is. A lot of people might not understand the connection there. With, you know, the real definition of epigenetics and how it connects to methylation. Um, yes. Okay. Well, then let's, yeah, let's back up and get a little bit, you know, more, more fundamental. And um, if you need some information, I can do, I could do a little write up Q and A or something if you're, if your folks want the background. Um, mm -hmm. So you're familiar with methylation, like, methyl transferase. you talked about COMT. And so that's a methyl transferase reaction that takes that SAMe molecule and transfers a methyl group from compound A to compound B. In the case of COMT, we use it to um, metabolize out adrenaline or adrenaline, you know, dopamine, mm -hmm. and actually to produce and, 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 and metabolize out. Um, methyl transferase reactions, there's actually a few hundred or a couple hundred methyl transferase enzymes in the body. So we're doing it all over the place. We're transferring a methyl group onto a different compound. We use it to COMT to metabolize out um, estrogens, as you know, as well. Mm -hmm. Same thing in the DNA. So DNA, methyl transferase, another methyl transferase enzyme, is quite simply putting a methyl group on cytosine, which is one of the DNA bases. When cytosine is actually next to a guanine, so it's, it's a CG site, it's a CG um, relationship, uh, the, the fifth position, the fifth carbon on a cytosine, uh, can be methylated. And mostly in mammals, the CG sites are uh, methylated and, you know, a sufficient amount of, of methyl groups on CG sites of a given gene will inhibit it. And, 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 off, and, and we can talk about these in the, you know, the, the gene has different regions. Mm -hmm. The promoter region of a gene is where transcription factors are going to land and turn that, you know, and allow that gene to be expressed. So whatever that gene codes for, um, it'll be turned on and making it. So whatever protein it happens to uh, participate in, let's say insulin, for example, uh, transcription factor is going to land on that insulin gene and, and turn it on and allow insulin to be produced. Um, if the promoter region is methylated, if you think about it, you know, is a carbon and three hydrogens, but if there, are, if that whole promoter region, all of those CG sites, you know, are, are the thousands of CG sites there are just riddled with methyl groups, that transcription factor isn't really going to be able to land on it and turn it on for expression. Um, and, and so hypermethylation inhibits, um, inhibits gene expression. And, you know, famously, again, circling back to what I was talking about previously, um, we see, it, we see um, the microenvironment in tumors able to really hypermethylate and turn off tumor suppressor genes. So we want our tumor suppressor genes up and running. We want them, you know, dealing with any cancerous changes in the body. Uh, mm -hmm. We want a good BRCA 
BRCA protein functionality. We want, you know, P53 on and, and, and humming and all the, you know, the myriad tumor suppressor genes. There's many, many, many of them. But in cancer, they're able to hypermethylate and turn expression off. So mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, we just want to, we want to be able to deal with that. And, you know, just to, to complete the thought, that's where I, I, I learned in the literature that, you know, some of our known and beloved polyphenols that exert such potent anti-cancer activity actually augment that. They, they, they inhibit um, the tumor microenvironment from shutting down tumor suppressor genes, or at least they help us do that. Mm -hmm. One other quick question about testing. Uh, have you used the sulfate marker on the organic acids as any clinical utility with uh, impaired methylation? Um, no, no, I haven't. Mm. Mm -mm. Okay. No. It would be, it would be a real distant cousin, mm -hmm. maybe not even a cousin, maybe a cousin like two times removed. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Yeah. It's not quite there. And let's just talk a little bit more of some of the specifics regarding the diet and the, the methylation diet. You had mentioned, you know, sleep, exercise, you know, stress and things like that and polyphenols. Can you talk a little bit more about some specifics as far as the foods that are emphasized in this diet? Yeah, for sure. I can. Yep. So we've got, well, you know, if you're, if your folks would like to, they can head over to our website. And um, it's just my name. It's just Dr. drcarafitzgerald.com. Um, and there's a whole recipe tab. And if they go to that recipe tab and they type in methylation, they'll get loads of recipes that are designed for, um, you know, for, from the, with the MDL principles in mind, with the meth methylation diet and lifestyle principles in mind. In fact, I think we've, we've got documents they can download. So the list of the methylation adaptogens, um, I think if you sign up for our newsletter, you can get that uh, download if you would, mm -hmm. if you want to, but just a little bit of background. So the diet is um, it's got eggs. We want, we want folks to have eggs as long as they can tolerate it because of course eggs are high in choline and, you know, choline is a really methylation demanding nutrient for our bodies to make. And it's considered conditionally essential because there are three steps of SAMe needed. There's a lot of SAMe needed for us to be able to make choline choline slash phosphatidylcholine. Um, so if we have a little, if we supply the body with a little bit of choline and eggs is, you know, right, arguably the, the best source, um, we can preserve it. We can save methyl donor drain. Uh, creatine, you know, for, for muscle energetics, sometimes we'll give people creatine to help with good methylation because again, it's such a methylation demanding process for the body to make it. If we give a little bit in, um, in a smoothie or, you know, just give somebody some extra creatine as a nutrient, we can preserve methyl donor drain. Um, what else do we have in there as superfoods? All the greens, you know, if you, you know, kale and spinach and, uh, sprouts, sea vegetables, um, you know, what else? Beets, of course, uh, you know, as long as somebody doesn't have kidney stones. I mean, if somebody did come to you with kidney stones, then you would want to look at this diet and be a little bit mindful around the oxalates, but that's, that's an easy tweak. Um, seeds, pumpkin seeds, sesame seeds, um, sunflower seeds, again, all rich in those methyl donor nutrients, just dance around the methylation scale, the methylation cycle. And, you know, you'll see the mineral, it's a mineral intensive cycle. Um, we need, you know, B12 foods, folate foods, et cetera. And so we've just tried to, tried to pack those methylation cycle nutrients into the diet. We give a little extra. It's not a. It's not an animal protein heavy diet, but we do recommend animal protein and liver, because methionine, of course, is a is an amino acid essential to the methylation cycle. Um, and then we layer in all of our the so called methylation um, superfoods and those or, or methylation adaptogens. Excuse me. And those are, of course, the. Um, you know, quercetin, resveratrol is another one, rosmarinic acid, um, EGCG, methane, curcumin, and so forth. Um, genistein, interestingly, is a potent methylation adaptogen um, and has some great research in animal studies on um, 
you know, on affecting pretty profound change. In fact, anybody who's familiar with the Agouti mice um, research, there's some good publications regarding genistein and the, the, the lead scientist in the Agouti mouse studies um, is Randy Jurdal, and I podcasted with him. So if anybody mm. decides they want to do a dive in this area, you can check out my conversation with Dr. Jurdal. It was really extraordinary. Mm. I'll also add that, um, you know, I mentioned earlier when I was talking about gametogenesis and embryogenesis that this demethylation, active demethylation happens as well. So we put the methyl donor, we put the methyl groups down on our DNA to inhibit expression and we can actually go in and remove them. We can clean them off using a group of enzymes called 1011 translocase enzymes. And the nutrients involved in optimal demethylation activity of the genome include vitamin C, alpha ketoglutarate, Vitamin A can actually potentiate the TET enzyme activity, as they're called. Um, vitamin D, E, selenium, zinc, all of these guys seem to have sort of an, a, an ability to um, make a difference on uh, regulating DNA methylation activity. Mm. So a skeptic might come in and say, well, you know, look at this diet and say, well, there's no sugar. There's no processed foods. Yep. Uh, intermittent no fasting. Food. Intermittent fasting is in there. Yep. It's a you little, know, it's, it's a lower carb. Yep. Yep. So just, give me your best skeptic pitch. It's just a really, really healthy diet. Yeah, uh, that's right. With that's right. nutrient dense, uh, yep. healthy fats. Yep. Good protein, lots of vegetables. Yep. Nuts and seeds. What would be the, you know, kind of the best explanation to say, well, this is really the methylation that uh, is is um, really the factor that's In making causing the difference. some really good good results. Well, okay, so let me. I'll talk to you about about that. I have a few comments. Um, one would be that if you look in the literature, you'll see that sugar messes up the methylome. <laughs> so right. of course we want to because it can have a negative a, it actually can have a pretty profoundly negative influence on epigenetic expression um you know and again a lot of this is animal studies but more human trials are coming forward um what else intermittent fasting being in a you know transitioning into ketosis a little bit here and there all of these are beneficial in epigenetic expression so we do want to think about them and we did want to build them into the diet mm -hmm. um and, but the you know what we can i i can see so some of the markers that we'll get into later on are very cl clearly suggest that we influence methylation favorably um, using the diet. So our mm. methyl donor heavy diet did have an impact, um, and we'll tease that out. I had we did not have any supplements, but we did use a probiotic. We use Lactobacillus plantarum, and there are some suggestions that certain strains will increase folate production. You know, endogenous you know bacterial production mm -hmm. of folate. So we included that, and we did include. Um, um, a, a methylate, what we call a methylation adaptogen powder. So it's basically a greens food concentrate full of all those polyphenols. We included that with our participants. Um, so there is a epigenetic, there, there are a number of epigenetic clocks out there. So we can look at patterns of DNA methylation and predict somebody's biological age. Um, this research has come out of UCLA, out of Steve Horbath's laboratory. Um, Steve Horbath incidentally lectured at this year's PLMI in October, Jeff Land's Personalized Lifestyle Medicine Institute. And Jeff makes those recordings available on his site. So if somebody is interested in listening to Steve, they can probably access his recording on Jeff's site. Um, or they just can Google him on YouTube and there's plenty of lectures there. So they can hear him talk about developing the epigenetic clocks. These clocks are looking at DNA methylation patterns. Um, and so a bit, an obvious question is what reverses epigenetic age, you know, or biological age and what, you know, adds to biological age. And they looked at some diet and lifestyle influences and found that, you know, the so-called healthy diet filled with, filled with healthy fats and, you know, adequate nutrients and veggie intake um, moved the clock slightly. 
Mm. Um, and so from, and, and there are other, you know, there are, there are some other data out there that show that they improve it. Um, and so, you know, there's, the, so that's the, I think that's the sort of the generic healthy diet that you were articulating. I, I, it, it, maybe we did a little bit better. You'll just have to stay tuned. <laughs> right. That. right. Well, so that would that would kind of be a comparison right there. Yeah, I mean that, and that would be enough to to make it convincing because mm -hmm. obviously it's a, it's a very very healthy diet. But you know, two people can be feeling pretty good, but one person might everything might just be working at a better level, and they could have a reduced risk of certain diseases if they were potentially following something like this, is that kind of the way you're looking at it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh yes. Right. Can we improve health span? Can we improve lifespan? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And because it's such DNA methylation is an important piece and you know, an important process at I think all uh, points in life, um, you know, and probably most intensely, you know, early on in develop, development from embryogenesis to, you know, early childhood, very intense. And then as we're aging, again, DNA methylation comes in, you know, and arguably is either, you know, improving our health span or not. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important for us to be thinking about it, you know, as we as we're on the aging journey and argue, and so here's the other thing because of this heritability component. So, um, so, so one thing that I didn't mention is that, um, the DNA methylation marks are pretty stable over time. It's actually a continuum. Some, some marks are so stable that, that they're heritable. Um, other marks are pretty changeable. It's a mm -hmm. continuum, and it and I know it's a lot to wrap to wrap our head around, but um, it, it means that you know, unlike say having a piece of sugar or a, a piece of cake and watching your blood sugar rise and fall over a discrete period of time, epigenetic changes can be lasting. You know, they can be lasting onto future generations if you're preconception, mm -hmm. for instance. And so there's a good argument that we want to be tending to optimal expression all of the time, especially as we begin to tease out which marks are, you know, very labile and changeable, you know, and which marks, you know, when we, when we, when we inhibit a certain gene expression are going to be around for a long time. You know, so as we really kind of tease out and understand that, it's best to really, I, I would say it's best to incorporate some of these concepts most of the time. Um, an example of a mark of, of, of DNA methylation that's not changing would be in um, chromosomal expression in female mammals. So, you know, me, for instance, or any, you know, any other female mammal, 2X two X, two X chromosomes, one X chromosome in every cell of the body is always shut down via, via methylation. And so that's always going to be preserved. That's a long-term mark that is change that's not going anywhere. But really interesting. Um, one of the things that they tested, I don't, were you paying attention um, with the Kelly twins? Scott Kelly went to outer space for a year. He, they're, they're astronauts and he spent a year in space and his astronaut twin, identical twin brother, Mark stayed home. Mm, I didn't read about that. Okay. Well, they were tested at baseline. So before Scott went to space, they tested him every which way, including their epigenome and, you know, all sorts, their telomere length. And just, they just looked at them every which way until Tuesday. So it turns out that after that year in space, when he came back, you know, I think the Guardian proclaimed identical twins, no longer identical after a year of space travel. The genetic expression changed so profoundly in in Scott, you know, that, that they proclaim them no longer identical twins. It was really kind of a funny, but, you know, sort of appropriate uh, proclamation. And what they, but, but as they tracked them over time, when Scott landed back on Earth, some of those epigenetic changes reverted back to baseline within days. Like they were very labile and they changed right back. Some of those are lasting. So we're still teasing that information out. Okay. That's that. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, observation with him. 
I'm going to have to read about that. So why don't we close with a case study so people can kind of get an overview of what this might look like. Are there any particular cases that come to mind in your practice and how you use the, this MBL plan? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's a good question. Um, one of the things, so, so there's a, there, I'm, and I'm thinking about it now because I can see her in my, in my email box here, Emily Ridbaum, her and her mom, uh, Leslie Stone, Leslie Stone teaches over at the Institute for Functional Medicine. She's a gynecologist. Emily is a nutritionist and they have a group, they, and they, Michael Stone, people might know because he's a long, long, long time IFM faculty and that's Emily's dad. Um, Leslie and Emily have a company called uh, Grow Baby Health and they have for preconception, for during pregnancy, been using the MDL in their patients since we launched it. And they have the most extraordinary birth outcomes. So just thinking about her now as a part of their whole care package, they use the MDL, particularly er early on when methylation is happening in embryogenesis. Um, so, so, so profoundly, like in the first trimester, arguably our principles are so important and impactful. Um, so that's one area where, you know, you could go to Grow Baby Health and actually read about their birth outcomes. They've published on them, but just, you know, the incidence of gestational diabetes, um, preeclampsia of, um, of, um, you know, early delivery. I don't know mm -hmm. why the term is just completely leaving my brain, but, um, and then, and then outcomes such as autism or, you know, issues in early infancy, you know, eczema, mm -hmm. allergies, et cetera, et cetera. Their whole, you know, mortality, morbidity, their whole, the all, all of their outcomes are much, much, much lower than general birth outcomes in this country. And we're actually not doing great considering we're such a wealthy, developed Western country with, you know, mm. access to perfect medical, medical care. We're actually, our birth outcomes are, are, are pretty poor. So mm -hmm. using it in that context has been really helpful. In our practice, we layer MDL principles into every single patient. And that means that regardless of our therapeutic intervention, we're starting them on something. Mm -hmm. Um, even if it's just adding the like the blueberries and rosmarinic acid and the brassica veggies and a little bit of liver or something like that, we're using these principles. So probably the two cases that are the most standout that will that we've written about are, you know, a case of chronic Lyme with mycotoxicity. He lives on the shoreline here on the East Coast and is sounds like an easy case. <laughs> yeah, really. That's right. That's right. He responded best to IVIG. He actually did IVIG for years and that took him out of the woods and then mm -hmm. IVIG stopped working for him. I mean, nobody nobody can go on for years getting IVIG, but he's he lived in a flooded house. You know, it was flooded by the the Long Island Sound here, you know, over and over and over again, but his elderly parents were there and he didn't want to leave. And so basically he refused to get out of this environment that was toxic to him. Um, he couldn't tolerate, so it, you know, his condition rendered it impossible for him to take any B12 um, or vitamin D, you know, mm -hmm. neither, neither he could tolerate it. He had this um, pretty profound, um, polyneuropathy presentation. So burning, a burning sensation on his thighs and his arms, just really, really profound fallout from his conditions. And he was able to tolerate the MDL. So you can imagine methylation, his homocysteine was always very high and his B12 was really low. Certainly the B12 deficiency was, was, was compounding the polyneuropathy and so forth. Um, and we used the MDL on him and when he was dialed into what we call our MDL intensive, he did fabulous. He did fabulously. He was able to tolerate the nutrients. His homocysteine dropped. His symptoms abated. And it was, so it was by far the best intervention um, mm -hmm. that we gave him. Similarly, uh, another patient with, uh, with, a, with a very complex um, neuropathic condition, you know, with an intolerance to um, methyl donor supplementation of any kind, you know, also adopted our program and, you know, likewise, we were able to turn her around. So I would say um, 
and then we'll have the study well, the study to report. So the interesting thing about our study is that these are all healthy middle-aged guys, and we'll have that outcome to report soon enough. Um, in our practice, the people that we've seen that we get that we put on the intensive program tend to be these people with really complex conditions um, who've failed elsewhere, and we tend to you know, and we've seen nice outcome with them. Um, Otherwise, we layer it into what other, whatever other um, therapeutic prescription we're doing. Excellent. So, Carrie, your website is drcarefitzgerald.com. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. And is there anywhere else you'd like people to find you online, or is your website the main hub? Um. That well, yeah. The web, my website's the main hub. Actually, we've got a really big in, an active Instagram, and mm. we've got an active Facebook, and they'll okay. you'll find you'll find stuff on this content there. Excellent. And any idea when the the study might be published? We're writing it up for publication now. I am scheduled to present at the. Um, annual international conference at Institute for Functional Medicine in May, and then mm -hmm. again at PLMI in October of 2020. So, um, you know, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully mm -hmm. before May, <laughs> but we are, we're actively writing now and, and we'll get it in. We'll get it in as soon as we can. Well, this has been great. I appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, Nick, I, thanks for reaching out to me and asking me. I know it's, it's surprising, isn't it? I bet you didn't quite mm -hmm. expect this, uh, to get an earful in this oh this way. was great and i'm really looking <laughs> forward to the study because i'll cover that mm -hmm. and uh, break it down as well so to all the listeners if you go to drhedberg.com and just search for dr fitzgerald i've made a full transcript of the show uh, so you'll get all the details of what we talked about and then when the study's published i'll link to that as well so Thanks for listening, everyone. Take care, and I uh, will talk to you next time.